So great to see everybody. Hi, Brian. I hope you're there. And Tristan is uh, recording. That's great. Yeah. Fabulous. Okay. So so a couple of announcements, and and then let's <laughs> finally finish chapter one. Um, so a couple of announcements. Uh, I sent, you have the final exam, is that right? Everybody's got a, a copy of the official final exam. On the final exam are the instructions, the date and time that it's due, and the actual question. So you should have that. If, if, if someone doesn't have that, email me. All right, um, so that's the first thing. I will remind you, all this information is on the final, but we'll have a kind of a verbal contract here. I will remind you that the final is due two weeks from this Thursday. Two weeks from this Thursday, the final is due on Thursday, May 14th by 3 p.m. I will already be at home, so email me um, the final by 3 p.m. your time, Pacific Standard Time, okay? In so in addition to that, I'm, I'm officially assigning all the reading. Um, I have assigned chapter two already. Let's go ahead and assign chapter three. So all of the official reading in Rorty is officially assigned. We are responsible for Rorty's introduction, chapter one, two, and three. And so let's go ahead and officially assign it because we will take, we will finish chapter one today. We will do chapter two on Tuesday, on Thursday and Tuesday, and then a week from this Thursday, we will have the last lecture um, on Rorty's chapter three, and then we will have moved through everything that we, we need to do well on the final. Okay, is everybody kind of clear about that? Yep, good, fabulous. Um, one more thing, I sent to all of you my lecture notes for chapter two. Did you guys get them? Yep, yes. fabulous, good. I hope they help. I'm again, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of editing these things, making them look kind of official. <laughs> you, should, you should see what they really look like before they get edited. So I'm going through my lecture notes, I'm editing them, making, look, making them look somewhat presentable um, and sending them to you to supplement your readings and to kind of alleviate some anxiety uh, about what we're doing, um, okay? So they're there for you, um, they're there to help you. Um, so go ahead and use them. And then I will uh, edit, uh, the, my lecture notes for chapter three, probably over the weekend, and send them to you over the weekend, all right? And then we'll have everything we need um, for you to maximize your chance of doing, doing very well in the class, all right? So, uh, oh, 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 last announcement, the most important one, oh my God. So this class is being officially reviewed, yes. Yeah, um, this this is the class that is being reviewed. So I've been asked to remind all of you to go on to the computer thing, the Canvas or the Moodle or something. I, I don't know what they call it anymore. Um, and there's a portal where you can log in and review Professor Dungey, and you can review the class. Um, and this is a requirement. This is something that the university requires that I do and that we do every semester. So. So I want, I'm pleased this class is to be reviewed. Go to the portal, sign in, and um, review the class. Uh, the university takes it seriously. Okay, um, any questions before we get started? Nope, all right. It's great to see all of you. As always, I hope you and your families are well, and uh, sending love. So uh, we're going to walk our way, talk our way through the completion of chapter one. Um, and so I, I realize we've taken three lectures to, to really move through chapter one. Um, and that may seem like a lot, but, but it's necessary, I think, because in some ways, chapter one's the most important of the chapters. Chapter one is where Rorty lays out this, his kind of postmodern pragmatist account of the contingency of language um, and, and what he means by that and, and how he wants to very deftly juxtapose this account of the contingency of language with traditional metaphysical or objective notions of language and, and why it's important, he wants to say, for us to adopt, to be seduced 
into looking at his way of thinking about language and using language because he thinks it's a he thinks it's not only a more interesting way to think about about language but even in the concept of his own construction of this he thinks it will enable us to do things that we can't currently do in our conception of language now and this is a really important part of the argument. There's always two parts of the argument when, when Rorty's talking about language. One, he, he wants to seduce us into saying to ourselves, boy, that David, Davidson, Wittgensteinian way of thinking about language as a human invention, words as tools, tools that describe our encounter with the world and ideas in our head, and the way that those descriptions are kind of metaphors and and we have we have metaphors and word tools for our private life and metaphors and world tours for our public life and and this is a you know we, this is what language is doing and this is how how it changes it's not just that Rorty wants to explain to us his account of language but equally as important as we will see in chapter two and chapter three right and this is what we've been kind of talking about already in chapter one. The second purpose of all of this is kind of Rorty's deeper argument that, that as, as vocabularies change, right? As, as vocabularies change, just what, what, what Nietzsche had called genealogy, uh, as vocabularies change, what is happening, Rorty argues, is that vocabularies change, new, new, new word, tools as descriptions as metaphors those kind of things new metaphors emerge because because the old metaphors the old ways of thinking about things the old ways of speaking about things the old ways of describing those things are kind of losing their utility they're using they're losing their usefulness right they are keeping us from wanting to do the half-baked, half kind of invented things we want to do. And so, so we're gonna pick up this part of Rorty's argument now. So we are, we left off on Thursday and, and I, I kind of stopped in the middle of the, right towards the end of the lecture on Thursday and really tried to kind of unpack this idea, this, this sort of Davidson, Wittgensteinian notion of, of how they understand language as metaphor um, and, and how it operates both in a private and in a public way. Now, we're going to see this more directly when we get to chapter two, but I wanted to introduce it there earlier because, because one, Lordy's already kind of talking about it now. And so having that context uh, was very valuable. So let's pick up chapter one. We're gonna we're gonna finish chapter one today, just so we walk all the way through the argument. We understand what the what the arguments are. So when we turn to chapter two on Thursday, we're really ready to go. So if you have the book, great, take the book, open it up, and let's just kind of follow along. This is a kind of sing song version with Professor Dungey doing Rorty. We're gonna sing song it. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're right in the middle of page 12, and, and we're talking, he, he's beginning to articulate this, this Wittgensteinian and Davidson notion of language as, as words that are invented, words are tools, what do tools do? They describe things, and the, and, and, and the things, and, and, and the content of the description is what is what literally Rorty calls a metaphor, right? It's a kind of a, it's a human invention. The, the word and the meaning and the description is a kind of invention that stands for something. So this is what he means by that. And Rorty wants to argue, right, that this is what language is and that, and that change in history, transformation and change in history is driven by the, the kind of dying off or the ending off 
of one set of metaphors, well, he, and, and a comprehensive set of metaphors, we'll call a vocabulary, the, the kind of way old metaphors, old, literally old ways of describing things, old ways of understanding things become no longer useful. The metaphors, the description of the metaphors no longer become useful or uninteresting in many ways, as we will see. And new metaphors, literally new ways of describing things, which one are, are kind of poetically more interesting for us, but also useful in a public way. How new metaphors emerge, right? That's where we are right now. Rorty's telling that story. And so right in the middle of chapter, uh, chapter of page 12 in chapter one, Rorty says, revolutionary achievements in the arts, revolutionary achievements, profound transformations, profound achievements in the arts, in the sciences, he says, and in moral and political thought typically occur when somebody realizes that two or more of our vocabularies are interfering with each other and proceeds to invent a new vocabulary to replace both, right? And, and what he's talking about here, and he gives the example of, for example, he's one example he gives is during the Renaissance, right? As medieval Europe kind of came to an end as the Renaissance emerged. You, you had these, these, this old vocabulary in many ways, and we'll just talk about science in this regard, right? You had this old vocabulary of science that, that had dominated literally Europe, and, and, and even New Testament Christianity had had sort of adopted this, but you'd have this dominant vocabulary that was Aristotelian, right? And, and it was the kind of dominant way of describing, thinking about and describing the physical universe. You had Aristotelian physics had, had not only been dominant all the way up to the, the emergence of New Testament Christianity, but even New Testament Christianity kind of adopted parts of Aristotelian physics that it could use, that it could co-opt and use, right? And, and, and Aristotle's vocabulary, his metaphors of the universe as being a series of, of crystalline spheres, perfect circle crystalline spheres with the earth in the middle, all the way up until the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of literally the Renaissance, that was the dominant vocabulary. It was a dominant way of thinking, speaking, describing as metaphor what the hell was going on in the physical universe, Aristotle's sort of crystalline spheres, right? And, and all of a sudden what happens in the Renaissance, as we know, um, da Vinci's alive, Kepler's alive, Copernicus is alive, Galileo will be alive in the late 1500s. All of a sudden there's this new, what as Rorty will describe it, this new, these new words, words that are tools and, and tools that, that begin to re-describe how the first wave of the physical scientists of the Renaissance are encountering the extant reality, how they're trying to kind of make sense of it, not in an objectively true sense, but just kind of, kind of explain it so they can do things with it, right? And so Rorty says this new vocabulary, right? And these new metaphors, these new scientific ways of describing and giving meaning to what people are experiencing, what they're encountering in the extant world, right, emerges. And so you have these, you have these two kind of vocabularies that are happening simultaneously. There's this entrenched, but kind of slowly dying, Aristotelian vocabulary about the natural universe, a bunch of crystalline spheres, and you have this new emergent vocabulary uh, that is emerging, this new set of metaphors. You have, you have people like Galileo, you have people like Copernicus, you have people like Kepler beginning to say, look, look, the language in which Aristotle described the universe is not, doesn't seem to equate with how we are speaking about it and describing the universe, right? And so you start to cultivate and articulate the emergence of new words and tools and descriptions. And so new metaphors start to emerge. And this is what Rorty's talking about, revolutionary achievements. Now, I just gave the example in the sciences. Last week, we gave the example in culture. We were talking about the emergence of jazz. We were talking about the emergence of, of rap music and hip hop, 
right? If you want to think of jazz as a revolutionary moment in the arts, if you want to think of the emergence of hip hop and rap as a revolutionary moment in music and the arts, if you want to think of the emergence of a kind of Galilean or, 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 or sort of a Copernicus or Kepler view, you think that as a revolution in the sciences. If you want to think about a revolution in moral, and, and it, not moral, but political, uh, political philosophy with Hobbes emerging in the 1500s, the 1600s, 1600, excuse me, to argue people are free. If you want to talk about revolutionary achievements in the sciences, in the arts, in political philosophy, think of those as those achievements as the expression of, way, of, of new ways in which people begin to articulate their encounter with the extant world and the concepts in their minds. And not just in, articulate that encounter, but create new, and literally, and this is gonna become important later, literally invent new words. Invent new words with new meanings slash descriptions that function as kind of metaphors. Right. And eventually, eventually what happens, Rorty will say, people come to say, come to see, God, that's a really interesting way of describing human freedom. Or that's a really interesting way of describing music or someone's personal experience. God, rap. What a what a fascinating way of describing one's political experience in, in rap. It's amazing. Right. Or what an interesting way to describe human nature as being objectively free rather than morally bound. God, that's really interesting. What an interesting way to, to conceive of the cosmos as the sun being the center and, 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 and not these perfect crystalline circles, but elliptical orbits of these planets. God, that's so interesting, right? And, and, and this is what Rorty's talking about. This is how society changes. This is how, how history changes. And it, it, it's a change in language. It is the articulation and the cultivation of new words as tools tools as meanings and meanings as modes of description okay and so and so he says revolutionary achievements in the arts in the sciences and in moral and political thought typically occur when somebody realizes that two or more of our vocabularies are interfering with each other and proceeds to invent a new vocabulary to replace both Right. And and he gives the example I was just giving in terms of the sciences. He says, he says, the traditional Aristotelian vocabulary got in the way of the mathematized vocabulary that was being developed in the 16th century by the students of mechanics. All right. So 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 this is the story he wants to tell. All right. Now, bottom of page 12. And and we already got deep into this last week. So now we can see what our discussion of really what last week was about in terms of the, the way in which the invention, the individual or pro, what Rorty will call private invention of new words with meanings um, as, as modes of tools and descriptions, how those become in many ways, first what, what Rorty will call in chapter two, private obsessions. Right, rap music was originally a private obsession. It was a private language, it was a private creation. It was a private language. It was a stylized and slang language, an invented language put to music. Right, it was. It is what Rorty will beautifully call a private obsession, which is which is true because this is this is how people were speaking about their experience in the world, whether it was you know of racism or police injustice or poverty or systemic inequality. Right, the, this. This, this beautiful fucking vocabulary and these word tools and these fascinating ways of describing things emerged out of a private obsession, right? And the way that ultimately private obsession meets a public need, right? That people start to say, God, what a great way to think about it. How fascinating, right? And so this is, so there's this process of learning to one, see language like that, and then to learn to become more sophisticated, once we learn that's what language is, to become better at doing that ourselves, to learn how to re-describe and re-describe lots and lots of things. And Rorty means this on every level of life. The, what, what, what Nietzsche called the aristocrat, right? This, this kind of meaning and value and purpose giver. Rorty will call the strong poet in chapter two. And, and the purpose becomes, right? This, this sort of hyper-valorized process 
of learning how to redescribe, redescribe, redescribe in the most erotic and interesting and creative and idiosyncratic ways we can, the language of our private lives, and then how to use the words that open a shared space to make those words better. And so he says at the bottom of page 12, right, when he's talking about the movement of language and all this, he says, the proper analogy, he writes, is with the invention of new tools. He's talking literally about words, right? Or music or ways of painting. When he talks about tools, right now we're talking, of course, about words. But, but anything that can be a tool, an artistic tool, to, to, to describe a kind of way of thinking or seeing, right? That can be anything. That can be painting. That can be music. That can be how you dress. That can be, that can be the clothes you make. Right? This can be anything. We're, right now we're talking about words to be true because we're talking about the contingency of language in chapter one. But this can be anything. Right? And so Rorty writes, the proper analogy is with the invention of new tools, words, music, right? painting, the invention of new tools to take the place of old tools. Right? We're going we're gonna to constantly be inventing new words as tools that have meaning which function as forms of description right and 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 one we should be doing that as intensely as we can individually ultimately but this is what's happening all the time anyways and and new tool new word tools descriptions emerge and they replace old ones right and not only does that account for how history moves but it also accounts for new ways of thinking and describing and talking about ourselves and about politics and the cosmos. The proper analogy, Rorty writes, is with the invention of new tools, to take the place of old tools, to come up with such a vocabulary, right? To come up with such a vocabulary is more like discarding the lever and the choke because one has invented the pulley, right? And, and so this, this whole way of thinking about new words, tools as descriptions that come to replace others, right? And, and, and if, if you wanted to put the emergence of early modern political philosophy in this kind of Rorty language, right? If you think about the way in the, in the late 1500s, early 1600s, mid 1600s, people like Grotius, right? Started talking about this thing called the state of nature, right? This, this, this kind of theoretical condition of, of natural and original condition of human life that was pre-moral and pre-political, right? Hobbes talks about the state of nature, right? The, the, these, these terms didn't exist in medieval political philosophy. They didn't exist in, in classical political philosophy. They didn't exist in New Testament Christian and medieval political philosophy. There was no such thing as a state of nature. Nature was God's creation. Nature was a platonic thing right, that was rationally accessible, or it was God's creation. There wasn't this, this Grotian or this, this Hobbesian or Lockean state of nature. The, the whole, the, 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 the word description didn't exist. What the word description implied, what it meant, how it was used to, to convey a broader sense of human experiences in the world and with respect to each other. The whole, the whole way of envisioning it didn't exist. It started to slowly emerge, and slowly people started talking in this way. The state of nature and, 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 and the fact that humans were objectively free, right? And politics isn't natural and politics emerges as a social contract. That, that whole vocabulary of those new words, those new tools to describe important things, right? That slowly emerges and it comes to emerge to replace the kind of classical and late medieval vocabulary of there's the king, right? And the king is chosen by God. And then, and then here's, here's the, the feudal lords, and, and here's the, the millions of acres the feudal lords own, and here are all these things called peasants that live on the feudal lord, right? And those peasants don't have freedom, and they don't matter, right? There's, there's a whole modern, if you want to think about modern political philosophy, state of nature, freedom, natural rights, social contract, right? All these is kind of new kind of word, tools, descriptions, constituting an emergent vocabulary that's coming on, 
right? And, and you look at the history of the 1500s, the 1600s, the 1700s in political philosophy, you see it, you see, you see it as a kind of battle. Nietzsche would call a contestation, right? And, and the end of one kind of discourse, this kind of medieval, feudal, aristocratic discourse and the emergence of modern political philosophy, state of nature, human freedom, objective, objective equality, natural rights, social contract. And, and this is literally what Rorty's talking about. The analogy, the proper analogy is with the invention of new tools, new philosophy tools, new art tools, new painting tools, new political tools, right? New words, literally the invention of new words. And I, and I bore you with this. I irritate the hell out of you by repeating this because one, it's critical to Rorty's argument and two, it's going to be critical to a, the later part of the argument, both at the end of this chapter and in chapter two and three, and when Rorty's going to say something kind of wild, right? And he's going to say, look, if we want to change how we think and live and be able to do different things, we literally have to stop speaking in a certain way, right? We literally have to stop using certain word tools as descriptions. We literally, we literally have to stop talking about things, and especially, as he'll say, things in an objectively true sense. We've got to stop talking about things in a metaphysical sense. The whole vocabulary, vocabulary of metaphysics, the whole vocabulary that there is a human nature or there's essence right, that there's a metaphysics, right, and that somehow human language and human mind has to negotiate and bring those two things together, the, the single individual with the objective one, right, that, that Rorty's going to say that whole, that's a kind of vocabulary, that metaphysical way of thinking, that we have to stop talking like that, literally, that's literally his goal, to, to get us to one day stop even using words as tools, as descriptions that in some way describe metaphysics. And so this is what he's getting at. The proper analogy is with the invention of new tools to take the place of old tools. To come up with such a vocabulary is more like discarding the lever and chalk. We're gonna discard the language of medieval feudalism and we're gonna replace it with the vocabulary of state of nature and objective freedom and natural rights. Okay. Now, top of 13. And, and we do this, we've already mentioned this, but I wanna walk you through the points where Rorty makes these points. So, so we do this, right? Because Rorty's argue, he uses his, he's talking about Wittgenstein and Davidson. And so this is who the, the his refers to generally. Top of page 13, he says the new vocabulary he, and he says his, he's talking about Davidson or, or, or Wittgenstein. We could just put the. The new vocabulary makes possible. The new vocabulary makes possible. For the first time, a formulation of its own purpose. This is really important. This is not just a rhetorical sentence. The vocabulary makes possible the formulation of its own purpose. This is really deep. It's really important right? Because it means, and, and this is getting at what we were just talking a little bit about, by changing how we think about words and thinking of words as tools and tools as descriptions and descriptions as kind of metaphors. In literally inventing new words, tools, and descriptions, we are literally changing our perception of reality. We are inventing and opening up new spaces of purposes, new spaces of meaning. We are slowly inventing and opening up new dimensions of what constitutes reality, right? This is very, this is, this is really profound, right? Th this is what's at stake. We are altering the meaning and the purpose and value of what constitutes reality. When we invent new words, when these words have new meanings because they are new ways of describing things, 
And these ways of describing things are kind of metaphors. Hey, freedom, freedom means the absence of motion, the, the absence of restraint on motion. The state of nature means the absence of, of, of an objective moral law and the, and the absence of objective political institutions. Ah, we, we, are, we are literally and kind of slowly inventing new types of realities. Right? And, and, and this is what he's talking about, top of page 13. The new vocabulary makes possible for the first time. Like I said, at, at the end of, of medieval feudalism, of Catholic medieval aristocratic feudalism, there was no such thing as a state of nature. <laughs> there was no such thing as this idea that people were objectively free in a profound sense. You were a peasant. <laughs> in monastic medieval feudalism, you and I were peasants. We weren't free. We weren't objectively free. And even if we were, there'd be nowhere to go. <laughs> right? The whole reality was just fundamentally sort of opened and defined and described by this vocabulary called late medieval monarchical aristocratic feudalism. Right? And so Rorty says, when we start to develop new words as tools of description, we are literally opening up new spaces of reality. And by the way, ultimately, Rorty wants us to do that in both inside our heads and our private life, and he wants us to do it in our politics. That's what the whole point of the damn book is. All right, so the new vocabulary makes possible for the first time a formulation of its own purposes. Inside the vocabulary, right, inside the operation of the vocabulary is the generation of its own meaning and purpose. And this is, and this is incredibly important because this is when we were talking what feels like 100 years ago, but it was just last week, when we were talking about this whole idea of truth, right? For Rorty, truth. Truth is not what Plato thought. Plato thought the truth was correspondence. Plato thought the truth was a type of correspondence between the ideas that are always already in my head, the correct word that I find for them, and how those ideas and my language corresponds to justice, the objective truth about justice. Right? And that's what they mean by the correspondence theory of truth or the coherence theory of truth. And Rorty says, that's not what truth is, right? Truth is, as we saw already in chapter one for Rorty, an agreement inside a particular language game. Truth is an agreement inside a pre-existing and operating language game, right? And so when Rorty says the new vocabulary makes possible for the first time a formulation, a, a, a visioning, a definition, a, a, a sense of meaning, a formulation of its own purpose. He's literally talking about the opening of new realities, the, the building of new realities as, as internal and coherent systems of thought that generate their own purposes, that generate their own truth. It is a tool for doing something which could not have been envisioned prior to the development of a particular set of descriptions, right? And, and, and again, just going back at the risk of, of boring you to tears, just going back to the transition from late medieval political philosophy to early modern political philosophy, right? The, the political philosophers right, of, of, of the late medieval era all the way up until the 1500s, they, they couldn't conceive of something like a state of nature in the way modern political philosophy conceives it. They couldn't conceive of this idea that the people had natural rights and that these rights, uh, because they redefined what human nature was, right? And that, that by virtue of being a human being in this new description, this new way of thinking and talking about the human, oh, this, this is an objectively true thing, objectively free thing, it's got these rights, right? That, that, that formulation, and the truth and the purposes that flow out of it, that was not conceivable to the political philosophers of the late Middle, East, Middle Ages. It wasn't. And if it was, no, trust me, no one talked about it. All right? It was a private, it was a kind of private fantasy. Maybe, maybe these things were rolling around in people's heads, right? But no one spoke about it. It didn't, didn't find expression yet. So middle of page 13, continuing on this line of argument. 
Davidson, so the, the first proper paragraph on 13, Brody writes, Davidson spells out the implications of Wittgenstein's treatment of vocabularies as tools, right? So Davidson is helping us understand Wittgenstein's sort of theory of language, words as tools, and, and, and also to think of it as playing language games. Wittgenstein says, when we're talking language, when we're, when we're inside language and we're using language, we're playing a game. It's like a game, like, like a game of Monopoly. It has rules. It has specific meanings and rules, right? And when you play the game, in order to play the game, you've got to play by the rules. Everybody, you get to roll the dice. If you get six, you get to move six. If you land on Broadway, then you either buy it or you pay rent and, and et cetera, right? Wittgenstein saw language as a game. We are speaking language games. Rorty calls different vocabularies language games. So that, that's what he's talking about here. So Davidson spells out the implication of Wittgenstein's treatment of vocabularies as tools by raising explicit doubts about the assumptions underlying traditional accounts of language, right? And, and now, the, and this is, this is again, Rorty's, Rorty's very helpful because after he kind of explains his account of language and why he wants to, to sort of entice us to see it as an interesting way, he returns and he says, okay, let me remind you what traditional or metaphysical notions of language are like. So he's very useful. He always gives you his account. And then he says, by the way, this is what metaphysical or traditional accounts of language assume. And, and, and this is what he says. So in the old, in the, in the traditional metaphysical notions of language, language is correspondence, right? These, under, these, these types of accounts of language have that questions like, is, is the language we are using the correct language, right? Traditional, traditional accounts of language, correspondence theories of language, right? Metaphysical accounts of language, objective accounts of language, whether they're philosophical, theological, or scientific, are always saying, hey, is this the right word? Is this the correct definition? right? Do I have the right word that's connecting me and my reason to the objective reality? Oh, is this the right word from God that's connecting me to the divine? Oh, is this the right algorithm, the symbolic math as a symbolic language? Is this the right algorithm that's connecting me and my reason to the speed of light? Oh, oh right? And so traditional accounts of language are always asking themselves, is this the correct language? Do I have the correct language to discover the truth, reveal the truth inside of me, to correspond with the truth, right? And, and again, Rorty is saying, and by the way, that's what I was talking about five minutes ago, when Rorty is really going to try to seduce us into this, this, this idea that we need to just stop talking like that. We need to stop thinking about language and we need to stop as, as a as sort of corresponding with the truth. And we need to stop asking the question, is this the objectively true language, right? Talking about that as a, voca as a type of metaphysical vocabulary, Rorty is going to argue, is actually getting in the way of the very interesting things we want to do with language, right? And then, so he says, these, these metaphysical accounts of language have always assumed or they've taken for granted that questions like, is the language we are presently using the right language? Is it adequate to its task as a medium of representation or expression as a kind of correspondence? Right? And then three lines down, Rorty says, and look, this assumption, right, we will, we will stop asking this question. We will stop asking this, this question, is this the right word for justice? The correct word, the true word. Is this the true algorithm of the unifying theory? Ah, oh, is this the true God's word in the Bible or in the Quran? We will stop asking that question and we will stop being obsessed with those issues. Once we abandon, literally let go, that vision of language. So this assumption that 
that I found the correct word or that the job of language and reason is to find the correct word so I correspond and discover objective truth in, in some way, right? That whole assumption, that whole project, right? He writes, that assumption, that entire project goes along with the assumption that our language, the language we speak now, the vocabulary at the disposable of educated inhabitants of the 20th century is somehow a unity that combines self and reality, right? right? And, 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 and once we let go of thinking about it in that way, these types of questions and these types of, of philosophical problems or scientific problems or moral problems, they disappear. Right? They disappear. Page 15, right in the middle of page 15, Rorty goes on, right in the middle of the page. He says, he says, think of the term mind or think of the term language, not as a name of a medium between the self and reality. Don't think of it as a medium. Don't think of it as correspondence. Right? Think of the term mind or language not as the name of a medium between self and reality, but simply as a flag, simply as a metaphor, which signals the desirability of using certain vocabulary when trying to cope with certain things. So stop thinking about it as a kind of objectively true thing and stop searching for the objectively true word that corresponds to essence or reveals nature and think of it as a metaphor. Page 16, top of 16. And he says, to see the history of language, to see the history of language and thus of the arts and the sciences and morality, Right? To see the history of all these things as the history of metaphor, as the history of words that are human inventions. Why are they inventions? Because they're tools. Why are they tools? Because they help us build things. What do they help us build? Reality. How do they do that? By giving a name and a definition to things we are experiencing and stuff in our head. What, how do those names and function? What's their purpose? They're descriptions. And we have all sorts of these words and these tools as ways of describing things so we can do things. Some private things and some public things. And by the way, those things are metaphors. And they have to be metaphors because there's no correspondence between the word and the essence. They are literally human descriptions that come in terms of vocabularies to constitute a kind of language game. Right, it's quite simple in a way. And so Rorty says, to see the history of language and of the arts and the sciences and morality as the history of metaphor is to drop the picture, is to give up the picture, stop thinking in this way, right? Is to drop the picture of human mind or human languages becoming better and better suited for the purposes for which God or nature designed them, right? And, and again, that's what I, and this is what I said earlier was leading up to this point. Rorty literally wants us to, to kind of abandon. He uses the word drop, <laughs> and he means it literally, right? Um, to abandon, to drop. Speaking in a certain way. Stop using certain types of words as tools and as descriptions that no longer serve their purpose. And Rorty is literally arguing that metaphysical accounts of words and language and truth are no longer useful. They're, they have become a worn out series of metaphors. They have become a worn out series, uh, a worn out vocabulary, a worn out way of dis 
thinking and describing the fact that there is a world out there <laughs> that all sorts of things and processes are the effects of causes that have nothing to do with human mind. Okay, right? To see the history of language and thus of the arts and sciences and the moral sense as the history of metaphor is to drop the picture of the human mind or human languages becoming better and better suited to the purposes for which God or nature designed them. Right? And, and in my terrible, stupid examples of last Thursday, even today, right? If we drop the idea that there is something called objectively true music, if we drop the idea that there's something called objectively true music, right? Right? And, 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 and therefore, if we drop the idea that there's something objectively true called music, then we also drop the idea about a debate. We, ought, we, we, we automatically drop or eliminate or abandon the great debate inside music about whether certain types of music really are music or aren't music or whether they're objectively good music or objectively inferior music. Right? And, and while this sounds like an abstract thing, this is an actually something kind of happening all the time. And, and even with my, my superficial understanding of rap and hip hop, when rap and hip hop music, and not just the music, the language, the poetry, the private, stylized, idiosyncratic language, the poetry, the lyrics of hip hop, and the music that was associated with it, when that first began to emerge as a private obsession in the Bronx in the 70s, right? Because people were telling a, a, a linguistic story, a poem about their experience. At first, it was, it was idiosyncratic. It was private. You had to be a part of the language game to understand it. When all of that was emerging, there was, of course, and there was this big debate. Well, that's not music. Whatever that is, I don't know what that is, but it's not music. Of course it was. And it turned out to change the effing world. And what Rorty is saying, if we stop, if we drop this whole idea that there's something objectively out there, like music or justice, and if we drop this idea that, that somehow, right, we, the nature of mind, reason, as a special faculty unique to human beings, that one, makes us aware of that truth, and if we activate it, provides us a correspondence to it through language. If we drop all of that, then we, then we drop these debates about true music, right? And then we drop these debates about, well, you know, um, rap really wasn't music, as people said. Right? Or as people in the 50s said, rock and roll isn't music. Right? Rock and roll isn't music. It's just some crazy shit. Elvis Presley is just some crazy shit. In the 70s, rap's not music. In the early 80s, rap's not music. It's just some crazy shit. Well, all, all of that is kind of made possible because we think that there's something objectively true called music. That, that our rational content and our language can somehow correspond to. So we can make these, these distinctions. Oh, no, no, Mozart's true music. Rap is just, I don't know what it is. Or rock and roll, or punk rock. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. Right? And this is what Rorty's saying. To see the history of language, and thus the arts, the sciences, and the moral sense as the history of metaphor is to drop the picture of the human mind or languages becoming better and better suited for the purposes for which God or nature intended. We've got to drop that whole picture, that whole vocabulary, that metaphysical vocabulary of words and tools that, that think they're describing something. The idea that language has a purpose, Rorty writes, the idea that language has a purpose, an objective purpose, 
The idea that language has an objective person purpose goes once the idea of language as medium goes. Once we drop this idea that, that we've got to find words or mathematical formulas that correspond to the essence. Once we drop that, the whole image of language as a, as a medium goes. We can see language fully as a kind of human invention. It's a tool that allows us to build things by describing things. In fact, we live in those things. We live in the realities. We live in the societies. We live in, we, we live in the meaning. We are building reality with word tools. But those world tours are contingent. They're historically contingent. They're nominalist. They're human inventions. They're kind of a search in power. They're both important, extraordinarily important, but not objectively real or objectively true. They're real, but not objectively true. Middle of page 16. Davidson, he writes, lets us think of the history of language and thus of culture as Darwin taught us to think of the history of a coral reef, right? And now Rorty's having fun, he's having fun. Old metaphors, that's not music. There's no state of nature. People aren't objectively free, right? Old metaphors, he says, Rorty says, in this Davidson Wittgensteinian story. Old metaphors are constantly dying off into literalness and then serving as the platform and foil for new metaphors. And this is happening all the time, Rorty says. This analogy lets us think of our language, that is, of the science and culture of 20th century Europe, the Enlightenment, that is, as something that took shape over time, that, that took shape as a result of a great number of sheer contingencies and redescriptions and redescriptions and redescriptions that eventually coalesce into a pattern of talking, kind of a way of talking, a pattern of talking that become vocabularies. Page 17, the last proper paragraph on page 17. This account of intellectual history, Rorty writes, chimes with Nietzsche's definition of truth as a mobile army of metaphors, right? And very famous Nietzschean description of truth. Truth is a mobile army of metaphors, right? And, and, and that's a kind of playful, poetic, useful way of thinking about the difference between truth Language and truth understood from a metaphysical point of view, and language and truth understood from this kind of nominalist, postmodern sort of way, right? For, so if we follow Nietzsche and we follow Rorty and now Davidson and Wittgenstein's notion, right? Okay, so words are human inventions. They're tools. We invent the word tools so we can do things, so we can build private meaning and we can build public meaning, so we can live inside a space of meaning. Okay, really important. And different tools help us do different things, okay. Now, those word tools, because they're human inventions and assertions of power, they're arbitrary. The actual words, tools, and the descriptions that emerge from this process are arbitrary. They don't actually correspond to anything objective out there. The world is out there, but the truth isn't, Rorty says. Okay. All right. So what we have are a whole bunch of very sophisticated and beautiful and powerful, some good, some bad, words as tools that function as descriptions. And ultimately, those descriptions are slash metaphors because they are representing something. This is the word tool description I give for justice. This is the word tool description I give for the tree. So they, 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 they are represented metaphors. Okay, so, so, so literally language, what Rorty will call vocabularies, broad vocabularies, are literally, a, <laughs> you just think of what language are, they're, they're, they're moving metaphors. They're a mobile army of metaphors. 
right? Language is a moving army of word tools descriptions that are constantly being contested, right? And, 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 and in, be, in being a kind of moving army of metaphors, a moving army of descriptions that in some way function as a coherent language game, right? I mean, there is some coherence. When I say, you know, if, if you know, after class and we, we go have some whiskey and I say, well, you know, you ask me what do I want to drink? And I say, well, I would like, I would like a little small glass of whiskey. You don't bring me a, a, a Coca-Cola. You don't bring me a Pepsi, right? You, we're, we're speaking, we're playing a language game. I say, I want this. And you understand what I want because we've already agreed on the meanings, generally speaking, of the word tools descriptions we're using, right? So, so, so truth is a function of agreement inside that. Language is a mobile army of metaphors. A kind of language game emerges out of it because we learn to use words in the same way. Until, of course, we don't. All right, and so so Rory is saying, look, we got to see truth as a mobile army of metaphors. Truth is what emerges from the contestation of all the of agreement about these these different words. Truth is a function of agreement inside of language games. Truth is a mobile army of metaphors. All right. Page 20, let's, let's, let's wrap this up. Page 20. The last sentence of the last paragraph, of the, of the first paragraph on page 20. And so find the first proper paragraph on page 20 and go one sentence up. And here, Rorty says in a much more simple and elegant way than I have tried to say for 30 minutes. So this is why Rorty's a genius, right? Here is, here is what we've been kind of talking about. Rorty says, as he's kind of making his argument, coming to a conclusion in chapter one, and this, this part of the chapter is, okay, so what do we want to do? What's the purpose of all of this? And Rorty says, 20, what we want to do is we want to change the way we talk. What we want to do is we want to change the way we talk. And his sentence goes like this. It is changing the way we talk. And therefore, he says, changing what we want to do and what we think we are, right? And, and this is, this is the, the deep implication here. We, we, we need to drop a certain understanding of mind and language as corresponding, hopefully, ever better and better and better, fitting with God's language or nature's language. We've got to drop that way of, of thinking about language and mind. And we've got to adopt this kind of Davidson Wittgensteinian notion of language as a human invention. They're tools. They're tools that help us do things. How do they do that? By describing our encounter with the world and things in our mind. Okay. Those are then, then those are descriptions and metaphors. And we'll and we'll use these word tool description metaphors for as long as they're useful, for as long as we can do what we want to do. And at some point those tools and those metaphors may become obsolete. They may, be, they, they, they may stand in the way of, of other things we want to do. And that's what Rorty is arguing metaphysics is now. Metaphysics is a tired vocabulary that is losing its utility, using its pragmatic utility, its poetic utility. And so he says, what we need to do, we need to change the way we talk. And we think about words and think about talking. And therefore, and when we do that, he says, and therefore, we need to change, and, and, and when we change, and therefore, by, by changing the way we talk and talk about language, we change what we want to do, and we change what and who we think we are. We, we, we open up new realities, poetic, aesthetic realities. In a Nietzschean view, one which drops the reality appearance distinction, to change how we talk is to change what, for our own purposes, we are. 
It's a beautiful line. It's an absolutely beautiful line. In a Nietzschean point of view, in this Davidson Wittgensteinian point of view, in this postmodern point of view, all these things are operating kind of simultaneously. In a Nietzschean view, one which drops the reality appearance distinction, the metaphysical distinction. To change how we talk is to change what, for our own purposes, we are. To say with Nietzsche that God is dead is to say that we, that there is no higher moral purpose, that the purpose of life is an aesthetic experience. The pur if, if you want to speak about purposes at all, they are defined and opened and mobilized in language as a creative project. Living life as a poetic experience. The Nietzschean substitution of self creation, right? As Nietzsche said, and we saw this already in our debate with, with, with Mill, the purpose of life for Nietzsche is one, to recognize the slave morality, two, to begin to disentangle ourselves from the slave morality, and three, to find the emotional courage and the poetic creativity and the strength to give our life meaning and value and purpose. And this is what Rorty's talking about. The Nietzschean substitution of self-creation for discovery substitutes a picture of the hungry generations treading each other down for a picture of humanity approaching closer and closer to the light. A culture in which Nietzschean metaphors were literalized would be one which took for granted that philosophical problems are as temporary as poetic problems. That there are no problems which bind the generations together in a single natural kind of thing called humanity. A sense of human history, a sense of language, a sense of subjectivity, of individuality, a sense of human history as the metaphor of successive metaphors would let us see the poet in the generic sense of the maker of new words, the shaper of new languages as the vanguard of the species. So the poet, think of revolutions in the arts, revolutions in the science, revolutions in culture, the revolutions in philosophy, literally as the, as the, uh, the invention of new words tools as descriptions and metaphors that help us do things. Life is an aesthetic. It's a creative phenomenon. It's an aesthetic experience. Consciousness is an aesthetic. It's an art, not aesthetic, aesthetic, artistic experience. Last, at the end of that paragraph on 20, he says, but I shall end the first chapter, he says, I shall end the first chapter, he says, by going back to the claim, which has been central to what I have been saying, that the world does not provide us with any criterion of choice between alternative metaphors, that we can only compare language or metaphors with one another, not with something beyond them called facts or the truth. Okay. Top of 21, let's close this up. The very idea, Rorty writes, that the world or the self has an intrinsic nature. The old metaphysical idea, the objective idea. The very idea that the world or the self, Mill's conception of the true self as a component of human nature. The very idea that the world or the self has an intrinsic nature, one which the physicist or the poet may have glimpsed, is a remnant of the idea that the world is a divine creation. The work of someone who had something in mind, who himself, God, spoke some language in which he described his own project. Only if we have some such picture in mind, some picture of the universe as either itself a person or as created by a person, can we make sense of the idea that the world has an intrinsic nature? For the cash value of that phrase is just that some vocabularies are better representations of the world than others. 
as opposed to being better tools for dealing with the world or for one another purpose. And here we go. To drop the idea of languages as representations, to give that up, the metaphysical idea of language as representation, and to be thoroughly Wittgensteinian in our approach to language would be to de-divinize the world. Only if we do that can we fully accept the argument I offered earlier. The argument that since truth is a property of sentences, since sentences are dependent on their existence upon vocabularies, and since vocabularies are made by human beings, so are truths. For as long as we think that the world names something we ought to respect, as well as cope with, something person-like in that it has a preferred description of itself, we shall insist that any philosophical account of truth, save intuition or truth is out there. We need to drop that whole idea. And then this is it. We'll finish it with this passage. On the view I am suggesting, the contingency of language, the claim that an adequate philosophical doctrine must make room for our intuitions is as reactionary a slogan, which begs the question at hand. For it is essential to my view that we have no pre-linguistic consciousness to which language needs to be adequate, no deep sense of how things are, which it is the duty of philosophers to spell out in language. All right. In chapter two, we are going to apply this analysis to the conception of individuality. All right? How are you guys doing? Doing Paul, good. Did you guys fall? Did I put you to sleep? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. All right, you guys. Um, love you very much, unconditionally. And um, we're going to begin chapter two on Thursday. All right, Professor, thank you. All right. All right. Thank you.